All right, guys, we're now on question seven from our summer 2017 0654 paper 41. Confusing again because usually it's three and six, this time it's seven. Who knows what happens there? Maybe they just have a little problem with the um, setup. We're looking at a speed time graph. And whenever you should think about you think about steam, a speed time graph, you should think about two things. One of them should be the gradient. Okay, the gradient of my speed time graph is the acceleration. Okay, another thing that we can know from a speed time graph is its area, and that is equal to the distance. All right. The reason I'm saying this is that. The questions repeat themselves, right? The style of question that you're asked will repeat itself. If you're given a graph, it's almost definite you're going to be asked to calculate one of those two things. Pop it in your brain, just get it ready. Okay, we've got our um, graph. We're being asked very simply to state the maximum speed reached by the car. Well, hopefully we're all confident with looking at this thing and then finding that my maximum speed up here is 4 meters per second. And then... Surprisingly, we're asked to calculate the total distance. All right, we're asked to calculate the total distance by the car. Now, I'm just going to show you what I did here, and I'll show you the working. What I've done is I've broken this up into three sections. Okay, one, two. My two is a bit unclear. Really, two is this thin strip just down here. Okay, maybe I'll just shade that. That is two right there, and then three on the other side. Okay, and what I think the simplest thing to do is just label this area one, area two, and area three add them together. All right, so this is my working. I've also written this very um, deliberate statement that the distance is the area under the graph. That's sometimes that's something that um, CIE requires to see. And what we're going to do is we're going to say that area one, area two, area three, add them together. We're going to calculate the values of each of those areas. And then we're going to do the adding up. And then ooh, we're going to remember to write the answer in, in the box as well. Okay. One and three are both triangles. So you've got to remember to use a half base times height, whereas two is a rectangle. I think we're all okay with those. Okay, my distance was 20 from A1, 20 from A2, and then 50 from A3. And so therefore I've got 20 plus 20 plus 50 is 90 meters. Okay. Surprisingly, we're then asked to calculate an acceleration. Remember, accelerations are gradients. Okay. So we want to show that the acceleration of the car during the first 10 seconds is 0 0.4 meters per second squared. Remember, proving questions are really nice because you know the answer, all right? So what they're basically saying is take the data I've given you and manipulate it so that you get my answer, all right? If you get anything else here, you've done some, you've, something's gone wrong, okay? The examiners will not be wrong with their answers. So you need to make sure your answer matches theirs. In this case, what I've done, I think the easiest thing is Take the end point and the beginning point, find their differences. This is 4 and 10, 0, 0. So really, we're finding the ratio of 4 minus 0. Remember, this is our gradient. Yeah. 4 minus 0 over 10 minus 0. Don't need to worry about the zeros. 4 divided by 10 is 0 0.4. Okay. We've calculated our acceleration. Okay, and then they tell us the mass. It told you the acceleration again. I think that's just so that you guys don't worry about it, okay? And you've been asked to calculate the force needed to produce an acceleration of 0 0.4. We're using F equal to M times A. I have no easy way of remembering that, okay? This is just something that I remember. F, M, A, okay? The working there, force is 950 mass times 0.4 acceleration, 380 newtons. Now, now we're going to talk about the, the air particles inside our tire. All right. What we should be aware is that aware of is that when we increase the temperature, that's giving our particles more kinetic energy. Okay. Now, in this case, what we're being asked to do is describe what these things are doing, not being asked to explain. All right. So you can simply say that the air particles move faster. If this was an explain question, then you'd be asked to say, well. The temperature is going up, the energy is going up, and therefore they move faster. However, here we're not asking for that. We are asking for a description. That's all you need to write. Okay. When the temperature in the air increases, the pressure in the tire increases. Explain in terms of the motion of the particles. Again, you have to talk about air particles. All right. 
So, straight in my first sentence, sentences, I've said, first sentence, I've said, there are more collisions, right, more rapid collisions with, uh, between the particles in the wall, and that's because of the faster motion of the particles. Really, I should write air particles. I'll add air in there just to be completely 110% correct. As a result, the amount of force on the tire wall increases, and so does the pressure. All right. Imagine the idea if we've got very gentle um, number of collisions every second. If we're hammering more and more and more and more and more, then we're getting more collisions. We're increasing the force. We're increasing the pressure. Okay. Last one here. A bit of a change of track. We've gone from talking about our um, about our kettle to this system, which is a, a relay. Now, relays um, are not directly on the syllabus. However, they are a machine that we might need to understand. What you've got here is um, a high voltage circuit and then a kind of horizontal arm and a vertical arm. Here, we've got a soft iron core. And this arm, by the way, is iron as well. We've got a soft iron core and a coil and a low voltage circuit. And what happens when I close this switch, this thing becomes an electromagnet okay so this is an electromagnet why well because there's current in the coil when I switch on yeah there's a current in the coil as soon as the current goes in there this iron becomes magnetic well, what happens to this bit of magnet this bit of the magnet gets attracted to um, to the soft iron core and as a result my whole arm my whole system pivots around here. If this moves to the left, you should see that this bit moves up. Well, the result of this is that these guy, this um, top arm hits the contacts, pushes them together, and as a result, that hole in the circuit gets closed. When the hole in the circuit closes, then the high voltage is able to pass. And that's what I've described here, okay? When the current flows in the coil, it becomes an electromagnet. This means that the iron up here is attracted to the electromagnet and it rotates about the pivot. When this happens, the contacts are closed by the horizontal arm and the high voltage circuit turns on. Now, you might wonder why we want to do that. Well, the reason is that when I'm doing this, I'm controlling a high voltage by using a low voltage. Now, as you know, we use our fingers to turn things on. If you're touching a high voltage circuit, then it's very dangerous. However, if I use a low voltage to control that high voltage, I'm protecting myself, I'm exposing myself to less risk and therefore keeping myself safe.